Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 9E, where we're going to complete our revisit of genome-wide association studies by talking about how to evaluate them. There's a number of complicating factors that a good study has to address. How phenotypes are defined and assigned to the participants in the study, the limitations of the SNPs that are available to be analyzed, the limitations in the population, and statistical limitations. And we're going to talk about all of these briefly. First is phenotypic issues. The results of a genome-wide association study are very sensitive to exactly how the phenotypes are characterized. This is the same issue that's extremely important for studies of heritability. In a study of, say, sexual orientation, it's extremely important how the study defines, for instance, homosexuality. For intelligence, what kind of test is used and what is it measuring? For mental illness, we showed the difference in heritability when we looked at different definitions of autism. So overall, the results were very sensitive to errors in assigning phenotypes, so it's very important that both the study fit its definition into the larger ideas about what are the key factors, and it's ensured that everybody who participates in the study has been subject to the same definition to assign them to phenotypic categories. Factors about the SNPs are also very important. Um, SNP typing doesn't include all the SNPs in the genome. It's, you know, 20 or 30 percent maybe. And it eliminates, it doesn't include many rare SNPs and, of course, many kinds of allelic examples of allelic variation that are too rare to count as SNPs. Furthermore, although in the previous lecture we talked about how rare crossovers are likely to be between a SNP allele and a causal allele, there are recombination hotspots in the genome. And if the causal allele is near a recombination hotspot, it may not be, be possible to detect linkage to non-causal SNP alleles. Population issues are really important. The study group may be too small. We saw in the height study that um, researchers said, well, maybe if we studied larger populations or larger populations or hundreds of thousands of people, maybe we could find more alleles. So if the study group is small, which can matter if the phenotype is relatively rare, that limits the power of the study to find the alleles. The SNP study group might not even contain the important rare alleles. This is especially important if the study group is small. Furthermore, the population may have genetically distinct subpopulations in which different alleles are connected to different aspects of the phenotype. This may be true both for the larger population and for the specific subpopulation that is used in the study. And finally, this is an enormous problem that statistical analysis must correct for what are called multiple comparisons. And I'll start but just by refreshing your mind about what we discussed in the previous module the use of, the st of statistical tests to assign a p-value, a threshold for deciding whether your results differ from the null hypothesis. And the standard threshold is the probability that your hypothesis is wrong has to be less than 0 0.05, I less than 1 in 20, before statisticians generally accept that the hypothesis should be discarded. Now I'm going to show you a cartoon. So this is from Randall Monroe's XKCD cartoon, and it raises the issue of whether jelly beans cause acne. So scientists are called in to find out whether jelly beans really cause acne, and they investigate whether there's a link between jelly beans and acne. They report back, no, nothing's going on. P is greater than 0.05. But the um, bosses say, wait, 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 maybe it's only a certain color. So let's go back to thinking about this question. Scientists are investigating whether jelly beans cause acne. Here's a question. 
what is the scientist's null hypothesis in this initial study? And their null hypothesis is that jelly beans don't cause acne. That's the boring expected result. The exciting result would be if they found that jelly beans did cause acne, but to discard the null hypothesis, they need results that are significant at p less than 0 0.05, and they don't have that. Okay, more panels. So the researchers investigate specific colors of jelly beans. Purple, no. Brown, no. Pink, no. Blue, no. 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 More colors. No. No. Not significant. Not significant. Not significant. Red. Green jelly beans. They find a significant result. But not significant for mauve or orange or peach or black or lilac or beige jelly beans. So the conclusion is oh, green jelly beans linked to acne. What's wrong with this conclusion? Well, the scientists did 20 tests. Each test used a 1 in 20 cutoff for the probability of making a wrong conclusion. But if you do this 20 times, odds are that you will make a false decision. At least you will make a false on average once. So one false positive test is the expected result if you use a cutoff of p equals 0 0.05 for 20 independent tests. So in fact, this result doesn't mean anything. This is the level of false positives that you expect from this kind of analysis. So no, green jelly beans are not linked to acne. So let's pull this back to the question of genome-wide association studies. So a genome-wide association study doesn't analyze 20 different colors of jelly beans. It analyzes between 500,000 and a million SNP positions. And each of these counts as an independent test within the study. If they used a cutoff of p equals 0 0.05 for each test, they would have 20,000, 20, 10 to 20,000 positive SNPs for each um, phenotype. And of course, that would be wrong. These would be this is the number of false positive SNPs you'd expect if you use that cutoff. Of course, they don't use that cutoff. Instead, their studies incorporate statistical corrections for multiple tests. So there are advanced statistics you can do to compensate for the fact that you did a whole lot of tests in your study. But it's not easy to decide what kind of statistical correction is appropriate when you've got such enormous sample sizes. And so this is probably one of the reasons that many of the correlations that are initially found by genome-wide association studies don't later hold up in later studies. So we've discussed the issues that a good genome-wide association study must consider. It has to consider how phenotypes are defined and assigned to the participants. If these are wrong, then the information is useless. It has to consider the properties of the SNPs. Does the study include the SNPs that it needs? It has to consider not just the size of the population that is being studied, the sample that's being used, but the possibility that there are subpopulations whose differences are not being captured by the study. And finally, the study has to include statistical corrections for the enormous amount of comparisons that are done. Coming up next, we're going to switch from thinking about um, heritability and genome-wide association studies to thinking about different kinds of breeding, starting with inbreeding. I hope to see you there.